So the purpose of this video, the third video in the statistics refresher set, is to go over the four different types of t-tests that students might use. Now, t-tests, the purpose of a t-test is to compare mean differences between two groups. And that's a key component. Really, you are limited to that two groups. Um, where your independent variable is a two-level categorical variable, usually a two-level nominal variable. Make sure to review the first video on levels of measurement if you need to have a refresher on that. The dependent variable is a continuous variable. That means it's going to be either a uh, ordinal, interval, or ratio variable. So there are four different types because t-tests can vary on two things. They can vary on the type of dependent variable. If the dependent variable is interval or ratio, that means we're going to have a parametric statistic. If we have a, a parametric t-test. If our dependent variable is ordinal, then we're going to have a non-parametric t-test. So those are the two things. If it's parametric, we're using, or if it's a interval or ratio, parametric. If it's a one Liker, or one Likert question or an ordinal, it's going to be non-parametric. Then t-tests are further subdivided based on how we organize the independent variable. If the independent variable is measured as an independent group, so that means that you can fit in only one or one and only one group, male or female, trained athlete or untrained. Then you're going to be an independent group's t-test if it's parametric, or a Mann-Whitney u-test if it's non-parametric. This is the most common types of t-tests done in our ind independent studies. Your other option, if students are tested repeatedly or under repeated conditions, then if it's a parametric test, it's a repeated measures t-test. If it's a non-parametric, it's a Wilcoxon signed rank. A repeated, or an example of a repeated measures might be when you have somebody, you know, test, you know, taste test Coke and taste test Pepsi. You, would, you wouldn't want to taste test them independently, you'd want to use an individual as their own control. So, just as a reminder, for parametric versus non-parametric, a parametric would usually have large sample sizes, over 30 is kind of a key standard, an interval or ratio dependent variable, and typically an essentially normal distribution. If you have a highly skewed distribution, your students should be doing a, the students should be doing a um, non-parametric t-test. A non-parametric has small sample sizes, ends that are less than 30, ordinal dependent variables, and a skewed distribution, so something that's strongly positively skewed or negatively skewed. Again, the independent or dependent groups, independent groups, individuals are measured just once under a single condition, where a repeat, repeated measures, individuals are measured under all conditions or tested under repeating occasions. So first we're going to go over an example of each of the four types. The independent groups t-test, an example research question would be, in the current study the researcher examined whether being in season or out of season would affect academic performance among student athletes. The substantive hypothesis that would be found at the end of the introduction of the journal manuscript would be student athletes in season are expected to record higher GPAs than student athletes out of season. And the null hypothesis found in Appendix A would be no significant mean difference in GPAs expected between student athletes in season and out of season. When they go and they conduct their t-test, they're going to get their means and standard deviations up here for each group. They would go through and they're going to read this first line, ideally, where they're going through and they have the t-test, the degrees of freedom, and then the, here's that p-value that they're comparing to a 0.05. Now, one of the things that we do like for them to check is homogeneity of variance. Homogeneity of variance is the assumption here that the variances of the y variable are essentially equal across both levels of x. That means that the variance, or the distribution, of GPAs for in-season athletes would be essentially similar as out-of-season athletes. If that p-value is greater than 0.05, then you've met the assumption of homogeneity of variance, and you would read the equal variance assumed line. If that p-value is less than 0.05, then the heterogeneity of variance would occur, and you equal the variances, not assumed line. Generally, unless your p-value or your sig was right around 0.05 for your t-test, the interpretation will not. 
So I go and I found that I had no difference between GPAs for in-season or out-of-season because my SIG was greater than 0.05, so no significant mean difference in grade point average w was found between in-season and out-of-season athletes. This would go in the results section of my paper. In the conclusion section, I'd take out the, the significant mean difference in the p-value, so all the statistical jargon, and I'd write in-season and out-of-season athletes are expected to have similar grade point averages. Now in comparison, I'm going to show a parametric repeated measures t-test. The test here, or the uh, research question here, the researcher wishes to examine whether trait anxiety decreases after a six-week yoga series. The substantive hypothesis is that employees will have a lower trait anxiety after a six-week yoga season series than at the beginning of the series. The null hypothesis would be no significant mean difference in trait anxiety will exist at the beginning of a six-week yoga series and at the end. Now if I look at my SPSS, I here I'm provided with information on again my means and my standard deviations so they can report that. This paired samples correlation isn't useful in this t-test in terms of reporting so your students can pretty much ignore this information. But they're going to go down and they're going to see and focus in on this component where they have a t of 8.46 and a p-value of 0, .00. So that 0, 0.00 is going to suggest that differences exist between the pretest and the post-test. To find out where those differences exist, the student's going to come back and look at the means. So when they come and they look at the means up here, it turns out that anxiety was lower post-test than it was a pretest, and we're going to use that information to write our findings and conclusion statements. So the findings, again, this should, would be found in your, the results section. Employees reported significantly lower trait anxiety after a six-week yoga series than before. And the conclusions, employees are expected to have lower levels of trait anxiety after participating in a six-week yoga session than at the beginning. Now we're moving into our non-parametric uh, t-test. This is the non-parametric independent groups version, so keep in mind this is for an independent groups test. So the example question here, the researcher wishes to determine if differences exist in satisfaction, and we're going to measure satisfaction on a 1 to 5 scale, of group exercise classes between male and female undergraduates. So we have an independent observation, so you can't be both male and female here. The substantive hypothesis, female undergraduates are expected to have higher satisfaction with group exercise classes than male. Our null hypothesis found in Appendix A, no significant mean rank difference in satisfaction with group exercise classes is expected between males and female undergraduate students. And that mean rank is important because a man with new test doesn't test means like a parametric test does. Man with new use test ranks or average ranks. So they have to make sure they have that. So when you run a man with new U, then this, this part over here is what you would find when you run a man with new use. So I actually encourage students to run two things to run the t-tests. First, they'll get their mean ranks, which again, ranks aren't all that interpretable because I said that scale was on a zero, or 1 to 5 scale. So then what, how do we interpret a 9.56 and 23.27? We don't. That's just used to calculate the U. So the U statistic is this 9.5. The students then also usually report the Z statistic, which is that negative 4.23, and the, sin, er, the SIG value of 0 .000. So we have a significant difference between the groups. Instead of determining those differences by looking at the mean ranks, I have the students find the information on the actual means. So they can actually ask SPSS to describe the means for them, in this situation, you can see that the mean satisfaction for females was higher at 3.79, was higher than the mean satisfaction for males, and we'll use that for our findings and conclusions. So our findings, female undergraduate students reported significantly greater P is less than 0.05 satisfaction with group exercise classes than male, um, and then for our Conclusion statement in the discussion, female undergraduates are expected to have greater satisfaction with group exercise classes than their male counterparts. One, this is the repeated measures non-parametric t-test, the Wilcoxon signed rank, where example question would be the researcher wishes to examine whether pain level on a 0 to 10 scale differences between two different types of ankle taping methods for female soccer players. So my substantive hypothesis, the researcher expects that 
higher levels of pain in female soccer players when using taping method A than taping method B. The null hypothesis here, no significant mean rank. Again, mean rank is an important part. Difference in pain level in female soccer players with taping method A, taping method A and taping method B. Again, I'll run my Wilcox and sign rank. I'll get my mean ranks here. You can see the output's a little bit easier to read. You get a z-score, negative 0.483, and the p-value, it's less than 0.05, so we do know that the pain levels are different. Again, I'm going to ask for separately for the means and standard deviations. Turns out that the pain levels we can see is a lot higher for taping method A at a 6.3 than for taping method B at a 3.43. So again, I'm going to use that for my findings and conclusions. Female soccer players reported significantly lower levels of pain with taping method A than with taping method B. And the conclusion here, female soccer players are expected to report lower levels of pain with taping method B than with taping method A. In general, when your students go look to present, bar graphs are probably the best thing to present on a... Um, for a t-test on a poster, something along the lines of what you see here in the bottom right corner where they have the bars for each of the groups. The, the bars are appropriately labeled, you have their means on the y-axis, and ideally you'd like to see your students include either a standard deviation or standard error bars in order to give that mean plus or minus a standard deviation. So that's the end of the t-test lecture. Um, the part, or move on to uh, video 4 in order to get correlations and chi-squares.